uh, the major project that the students worked on in class. The previous presentations gave you an idea of what they've been doing on their internship days, which are Tuesday and Thursday. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, they're in class with the instructors Ben and Steve. Um, for people who don't know, they're receiving college credit for that class. They'll be getting an environmental science credit through City Colleges, which is great for them. Um, and they've been working on a really long-term interdisciplinary project that's awesome. It was so awesome that I just felt like we got to present them here. Um, so I'm going to let one of the students introduce it and tell you a little more what it's about. We'll have several groups presenting. And then at the end, we would love, love your questions. So this is supposed to be, I know, as, supposed to be a, as realistic as we can make it under the circumstances, um, land use planning project. So for staff and the audience, please use your expertise in those areas to ask um, intelligent and hard questions. Um, the kids have done a ton of research, so they're really knowledgeable. Um, and for other people, you can ask any question that you think comes up uh, from the perspective of a homeowner, from the perspective of city government or a private company. Um, the questions are going to be a part of the presentation, so we encourage them. Um, and that will be all the way at the end, though, just to keep things rolling. So Jocelyn Ramirez is going to introduce the project to you guys, and then we'll get going. This, this is the 
layout of our land and all the things we added. We put in a wind turbine, we put in our fracking well clay, we have tree buffers along the stream, we have a farm building that is LEED certified and rotational grading. Okay, so I'm in charge of the LEED certified building and in order to become Platinum LEED certified, you have to have at least 80 out of 110 points on a LEED checklist. And so one of the features of my LEED building is a green roof. And green roofs have several purposes, like absorbing rainwater, providing insulation, and creating a habitat for wildlife and helping to lower air temperatures. Plants commonly used on green roofs are native plants so reducing the need for irrigation and therefore saving water and energy. The properties, I um, mean the parts of the roof not covered by plants can be painted white because white reflects sunlight and cools the building naturally and saves energy and reduces the heat island effect that raises the temperature of urban areas. So a rainwater blend collects rainwater from like surrounding land and the building and stores and filters contaminants out of the water. Radiant flooring system consists of tubes underneath the flooring that carry warm water on cold days to warm the building and cold water on hot days to cool the building. And that saves energy. And high performance windows allow direct and reflected sunlight into the building, reducing the use of artificial light. Um, I focused on um, low flow toilets, and low flow toilets use 1.6 gallons per flush, whereas conventional toilets use as much as 3.5 gallons per flush, and that's 40% less water than conventional toilets. And the light blue on the graph is how many gallons low flow toilets use, as opposed to the dark blue, which is conventional, conventional toilets. And there's a as I said before, we were introduced. We're introducing hydraulic fracking. Um, reasons why we want to do this is it eases reliance on foreign oil. It's an alternate use of coal, and it's greener in a way. It let <coughs> it produces less CO two emissions than coal, and creates jobs and buildings and building local economy. The process with fracking goes with millions of gallons of water, sand, and chemicals. The water, sand, and chemicals are pumped underground in a well, and the chemicals crack the rocks underground. And after the rocks are cracked, the shale oil and shale gas come from out of the rocks and is brought up to use for energy. And here's a video to further further to explain what hydraulic fracking is. Hydraulic fracturing is a time-tested, proven technology. It's been used in more than one million wells worldwide for the past six decades. This is how it works. First, once the necessary infrastructure is in place, a drilling rig is assembled and inspected in accordance with the required safety and environmental standards. Only once we are satisfied that all the required standards have been met can drilling begin. When the well is drilled, multiple layers of cement and steel casing are inserted to create an impermeable barrier between the well and the groundwater. The well is drilled vertically until it nears the shale zone. Just prior to the shale zone, the well turns and horizontal drilling begins. 
The Empire State Building extends 1,453 feet from base to tip. The depth of a well can be over eight Empire State Buildings. After another cement casing is put in place to ensure maximum system integrity, a perforating device is inserted to create small holes in the casing and the rock. Then, fluids comprised predominantly of water and sand are pumped down into the well bore, creating tiny hairline fractures. Gas trapped in the shale zone is released within the tiny hairline fractures and safely brought up the well bore and to the surface. America has vast amounts of natural gas, which can provide a clean and burning source of energy for more than 100 years. Technology is making it possible to safely and responsibly unlock this energy endowment.
and we are going to recycle it by desalinating it and using clean wave by Halloran, which uses electrocoagulation to clean the water. And electrocoagulation is when you put an electric current into the water, which separates the water from suspended particles in the water, and causes them to float up to the surface, and then you take out the suspended, suspended particles with a surface skimmer. Another thing we're gonna do with the water that we can't recycle is put it into a flowback pit, and since we are using clean stem fracking fluid, it will not have the health problems associated with standard fracking fluid. And um, we are gonna have those trees for that absorb the methane. And the methane, although it absorbs more heat than carbon dioxide, it stays in the air a lot of a shorter time than carbon dioxide. So a problem we had in our stream was that it was being eroded. And to fix that, we would install live sticks, and that's uh, tree cuttings for stream banks to help stabilization. And the type of tree we would use is willow posts. And to do so, you would cut the stream bank for a flatter slope, and that shouldn't affect, or that shouldn't put any sediments into the stream to affect any of the otters downstream or the organic farm. And we would also install the posts during dormant season, and that's when they're at biological rest when they're not growing. And that's like between October through March. And we would place them two to four stakes per square yard with a total width of 15 feet. And we chose this as opposed to creating a dam or channelizing it because it creates more problems with the environment if you do so, because it removes the natural habitat, and this doesn't, it actually helps. And the estimated cost is 7,185 for 1,000 linear feet. And for improving the water quality, we would place the tree buffers, um, as you see right there in the picture, along the stream bank. And that helps um, control erosion and prevents pollutants from entering the water. And that pollutants, pollutants can be from the cattle waste and from fracking. And it also provides shade, which is important for the environment, to lower the temperature of the stream. And it also creates shelter for the wildlife. And the type of tree we would be using is silky dogwood. and it's because it's cheap and it's native. And we would, to do this, we would plow land for planting and we would place the trees um, 10 feet apart for 1,000 linear feet and two rows of 100 dogwoods. Um, and the estimated cost of this is 1,370. And this is a picture of the tree buffers and how they help um, with not allowing any and we would also exclude the cattle from the stream because it's being polluted by the raising cattle and they should be as far from the stream as possible and to do that we would have electrical fencing which again is cheap and is beneficial and it we would also do rotational grazing so the like the land won't get overgrazed, and the estimated cost of this is one thousand one hundred seventy-five. And now we will introduce land parcel three.
And a few features of that warehouse will be solar panels, a green roof, drain water systems, and LED lighting. Um, green roof, well, um, pros for a green roof um, is it helps with energy use reduction, removing pollutants from the air, helps reduce the heat island effect. It helps with storm management and reduces the amount of greenhouse gases. Our green roof will be an extensive green roof, which means that it would have um, smaller plants that are shallow rooted because extensive green roofs usually only have about six inches of soil, and native plants because they would need less um, mercury and obtaining it. So this is a heat flow comparison um, chart that EPA, um, from a study that the EPA did in Canada. And um, the blue is on a building, well, they're the same building, but the blue is when, out, when the building did not have a green roof, and the orange is when the extensive green roof was um, installed. And if you look from the months of May through September and December 2001, the um, kilowatt hours of energy was between six and eight, and when the green roof was installed, it saved between 1.5 to 2 kilowatt hours, which is about a 75% reduction in the demand of energy, meaning that you know, they weren't using air conditioning or heating in the winter and the summer because of the insulation due to the roof. Okay, so this parking lot is going to be accompanied by a decertified um, warehouse. Well, pardon me. Well, my plan is very simple. I want two bottles that so are 450 square feet, and I want TXF cement. Why TXF cement? As a bone catch principle, as well as it prevents serious gases such as nitrogen oxide or sulfur oxide, and also helps our endangered dragonflies from benzene. Okay, so the first graph you see is just the efficiency of the biosol. Now, you see the rate of inflow the reservoir routing outflow, and the swim water management model outflow. That's also the one that is labeled yellow. Now, you see they have a distinct relationship with that thing on the y-axis that says the rate of outflow. All of them are very high because it signifies this type of relationship. As, water, as storm water runoff is coming within the bioswell, it's constantly being pumped back out. It's being pumped back out as um, well water and filtered and clean water. And then this course is showing how the TXF cement compared to just non-regular cement, that would be the multi without TXF cement. It's showing how effective it is within an area that has a lot of air pollution, or in this case, nitrogen oxide. So I'm a story of prairie, and it's 40 acres of old farmland, and this is a picture of what old farmland looked like. There's also a small stream that runs through my area, which makes it really easy for me to have a negative effect on the wetland that's just south of our property. So with this, my more environmentally friendly option would be to mold the entire area to kill off the weeds. My prairie also contains three different soil types, so all my, se my seeds will be able to be adaptable in three different kinds of soil types. In order to plant these seeds, I will use a no soil drill, which has no disturbance on the soil, and it reduces erosion. So my job is to preserve a species of weather. Because of the runway construction, the hind of dragonfly, which is an endangered species, is being friend again. So my job is basically to just look up any laws that can protect the dragonfly and to be sure I looked up federal laws, which is the endangered species act. Now because this species is already listed, it's basically safe from any harassment, any destruction, and what was I going to <laughs> Now, as an independent ecologist, I'll be working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services because technically, even though it lives in the weather, it's basically a land animal. And because it's already protected by the law, I still have other issues I have to deal with, such as bending mentally. They're basically polluting the air, but my main concern is gathering because they have pesticides they're using, and while it's not really a big threat, there is just the groundwater. Now, basically, because Vanley is polluting the water and gathering is basically half flooding, there's chemicals in the water, and even though wetlands they can filter out chemicals pretty well, there's still the groundwater I have to deal with. 
So let's see is the wetland now. The one is tend to be already protected because of the highest animal driving flight, but I want to be sure. <coughs> so because the, because 50% of our wetlands are already gone since the past 20 years, I basically already have a lot of laws protecting this. It's actually a warning. So the EPA actually enacted the Clean Water Act and Section 404 specifically ensures the health of this ecosystem. Now, if there was to be a contamination, basically, I would call any federal agency that would help me, basically, EPA, Wildlife Services, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They basically go over there and they test the water. If I see chemicals that come from plastic products, it's probably from amylate. If I see stuff such as antidepressants or birth control, it's probably the flooding from Godfrey City. If I see anything like that, I basically roll there and say, hey, we have a problem. <laughs> now, to preserve the wetland, there's also something I want to mention called a buffer zone. It's basically a zone that separates one land from the other, so the best way I can describe it. Buffer zone is it could be anywhere from 15 to 30 feet, so I just chose 25. And that's enough for the wetlands to be separated by Simone's Prairie and Jesse Park and I. Um, And we can use that manual 
as sua palavra. This is what the word of Christ looks like. We are using the word of Christ like to um, protect the person from my dressing. And this is the um, dating plant we are reproducing in the virus in Africa. And this is our remember vaccine.
Alright, um, one of the other goals is prayer restoration. And here we want to do uh, tall grass prayer. Um, this is originally a bell pasture land, so it's pre it was previously in use and it consists mostly of weeds. And we're, to get rid of those, we need to do some mowing. Um, that was chosen because with herbicide, there won't be any runoff. Um, the types of plants, uh, these are the types of plants. The first set was chosen because um, we had to come up with a compromise of shady oaks, which will come in later. Um, for when the bison migrate through their land, um, they didn't want any um, any plants that they didn't have. So whatever plants they had, we came up with a compromise to put in, in the prairie in our land. And the second would be um, um, plants that we can use uh, along the banks for things like to prevent erosion and um, to shade the river. And then um, the actual planting, we decided to use a no-till drill because uh, it, it has a reasonable amount of spacing when it actually plants the seeds. And it doesn't turn over the soil, so erosion won't occur. And then weeding again, mowing, so with, with the herbicides, no runoff. And those are some pictures. Um, the mow, the no-till drill, and some of the trees that we'll be using along the banks. And then uh, the final one is stream restoration. We had to do a meandering and pool ripple sequence. So the meandering and the pool ripple sequence will um, work together to help stop, uh, prevent erosion and prevent over, uh, extreme flooding. And then uh, cutting back the bank will, could also help with um, preventing extreme flooding and erosion. And then illustration of the pool ripple and then the meandering stream. And that concludes our land, Parcel 5. We would like to introduce Parcel 7.
burnout area on our track, but not pollute the area also. So we came up with uh, an idea that Sweden does, they burn your trash, and what it does is that, you see where the biomass is, we will put in the biomass into the border, and the border will um, heat up the pipe where the water goes into. The water will turn into steam, and then it'll uh, speed, uh, power up the uh, turbine. That in turn will power up the generator electricity for us. And the stack to prevent it, the way, the reason why this is uh, good is because at the stack, uh, there's a, a filter that turns the waste, the ash, per se, and turns it to power power, which is a non-residue um, element that doesn't hurt the environment at all. And with the water, what we decided to do is that we mentioned the water will heat up so much that it's, we have to um, recycle it. So what we did is that we're going to leak it out I and mean, transport it to the country club where there's the uh, tacos. And then once it's cooled enough, they'll be able to use it without burning themselves. <laughs>
So I was in charge of the LEED Certified Visitor Center, which we are focusing on a few main points. One is to become net positive, which if you guys don't know, net positive means we're producing so much energy that we're completely off the grid. So we don't need any energy, like we don't need to pay for electricity, which can be pretty nice because we can sell it back to electricity bill. We can sell it back. We can sell it back to electricity company. And instead of getting a bill each month, we can get a check. <laughs> which is pretty nice. Um, we are gonna incorporate a green roof garden like most other people. Uh, we're gonna use recycled wood. So instead of chopping down new trees, we would just use old trees or like throwing out wood for our flooring. Uh, we want to incorporate solar panels on green roof too and natural shading. Uh, we want to have a di dynamo power gym, which if you don't know what di dynamo power is, it's whenever you have those flashlights, you have to like keep squeezing to like turn on. That's basically it. But we turn it into like a stationary bike, whereas they pedal, they're generating power. They can go to the building or go back to to sell. Um, we have an underground cave that we use for <laughs> our cooling. So instead of paying power for like air conditioning, we can have just nice cool air whenever we want. Um, we're going to use recycled rainwater for our building and use LED lights. So I do like a little schematic of what I would think the visitor center would look like. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but the green would be the green roof that's on top. The circles would, are basically the little triangles, which would collect all the rainwater that we would use to use for seams that go through a filter or be used for a boat. So I want to focus on why we pick LED over four less, four less, I can't say that. So we're going to see that, see that, like, so we pick LED because they have a 50,000 50, hour lifespan when CF light bulbs only have 8,000, which is a pretty big difference. Uh, the LED uses less wattage, which is basically the amount of power, which I actually have a graph that shows. It's kind of hard to see, but lumens means how bright it gets. So at 500, while well, LED is using 4.5, CF is using 11 watts, which is pretty big, especially when you get all the way to the end of the graph, which is about 2,500. It's 25.5 for LED, while CF is using 43, which is almost up, pretty bad. Um, LED, LEDs do not use mer mercury, mercury when CF does. And the only thing bad about LED light bulbs is they're a little bit more expensive. Not too much, but they are more expensive.
the roots then act as a sort of filtration system from chemicals and fertilizers from nearby fields, um, and they would protect from erosion. Um, so one of the special features of our land parcel is that we have uh, dunes uh, along the lake, and the dunes have been uh, eroded because of people driving <coughs> down in their ATVs and foot traffic and stuff like that. So the dunes have eroded and they're basically they're just kind of like not what we want them to be. Um, so there's 50 acres of dunes. There's 20 acres of dunes along the shoreline that need to be uh, restored and 30 acres of dunes, dune and soil habitat behind the shoreline dunes. Um, so the sand dunes are going to have to be off limits to all people and vehicles um, during the five year restoration. Um, and the forested natural areas on the eastern side of our parcel will be open for trails and ATVs and stuff like that. Um, Eco-friendly ATVs or EUVs, Earth Utility Vehicles, will be available for rent at our visitor center and they'll be uh, solar powered. Um, and we'll have, we'll recruit volunteers for all the restoration work that we do on the dunes. We'll be planting native plants, native grasses like American beach grass, which is used in a lot of dune restorations because the root systems actually hold the sand together and prevent the sand from going away and the leaves above the sand kind of slope down the wind and prevent sand from being blown away. Um, temporary sand fences will be used um, to prevent more beach erosion. They slow down, like, like the leaves, they slow down wind and stop the sand from blowing away. <laughs> Um, so, in order to continue drawing in tourists for our parcel, which is a big, uh, a big deal for our parcel, um, we're going to have trails and boardwalks throughout all our natural areas. We'll have low impact boardwalks, which are basically just 48 inches wide, and they'll um, cut, go over the swales so that they don't, so people don't trample wildlife. Um, they'll be constructed in the, in the winter when there's less, when it will be less invasive. On Wildlife, um, and they'll be, uh, they'll have a little rim along the edges of two by four rims so that they're wheelchair friendly and people from the Shady Oaks old folks home will be able to come visit us. Um, so, um, my job was to take care of the invasive species removal, and the three species that I dealt with were garlic mustard, tree of heaven, and black locusts. So the plan of attack for these three species were when they're young seedlings and developing plants, they're either going to be mowed, burned, and cut. That requires a lot of labor, which we have a budget for. And the, for a tree of heaven and the black locust, we're going to woodchuck them so they can be used for a low impact trail. Oh, in just in case no one else, uh, I mean, some people don't know what an invasive species is. It's a non-native exotic that um, harms and disrupts native species, so they're bad, and if you have some, you should get them. <laughs> um, the use of our herbicides that we're using is glyphosate and triclofer. Um, wood mulch is good to use for low impact trails because they can aerate the nitrogen levels within the ground, and they're good to drain water. Gravel is low impact for animals, so it won't disrupt any wildlife's homes. Another uh, curve that was thrown at us were zebra mussels, and they were introduced to the United States in 1986, and they were found in the Great Lakes. Many people recognize that they were uses when they were following their water intake pipes. So there are many chemi chemical methods you can use to get rid of these, but they would either harm our aquatic life or kill off many um, great um, aquatic species in our waters. So the, the method that we chose was Zeponox, which is a reduced it's quite a pesticide, and it has great insulation. And it's it is expensive, but what you have to do to it, install it is inexpensive, so it has a lot of perks. So that's it. Thank you.
up with some questions. So actually, I think if we can have everyone come up to the stage. <laughs> and if anyone has any questions about how bison are going to trample the elderly, or how fracking is a good thing, or um, anything you might have a question on, please raise your hand and we'll try to address it. Yes, you. On the uh, need of certified buildings, did anyone look at geothermal heat and cooling? <laughs> geothermal, were you using the earth score? No. So we're like, that's going to be expensive for us and for them. So we decided to get rid of the um, dam and to let the otters take over the river. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anybody else have an example of where you compromised for the benefit of someone else's parcel? Or the mutual benefit? Um, the bison. We uh, were afraid about the bison going through our golf course while the people were golfing. <laughs> so we decided to make a fence to make sure they won't go in there. Oh, and the, we're afraid that the bison were going to eat the hard golf balls. So we made the golf balls uh, fish food. So they'll just, they'll just eat it as it's food. <laughs> and those are real, they found a real product, biodegradable golf balls for you. Um, we also have a question? Yeah, Marina. On the group that said that they would resell their electricity, aren't there laws, um, Illinois laws, that um, impose taxes on those who try to resell their electricity? So it makes it harder, harder for them to resell it. How would we be able to handle it? That is a good But there were other 
there are other characteristics of our building that we get our electricity from. Do you have a question? Yeah, well, I was wondering uh, if you guys know what the unemployment of your state is. <laughs> <laughs> Zero percent. <Zero percent>. <laughs> <laughs> They're all employed doing what's very short. Or What's the downside to fracking? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as we said before, there's health effects to fracking, but if kept isolated enough and there's no direct contact between humans or cattle, there's no effect. But again, like the chemicals in fracking can cause stuff such as cancer or respiratory respiratory problems. And we would recommend our client that asked us to do that to not do it because it has those effects. Yes. Just to clarify that as part of the project they were working under certain guidelines to sort of engineer that they would run into these conflicts. So they were required, they were a consultant firm that was asked to figure out how to do fracking on the land. Well, there are alternatives like wind energy and solar power, but we were hired to do it, so we couldn't suggest alternatives. It was just our proposed plan since that land happened to have Marcellus shale under it, so we had to frack on it. Was there a different type of fracking you could have done instead of one drilling? We could have done vertical drilling, but the way that it worked out, it wouldn't have captured as much of the oil as our client wanted, and it wasn't as efficient, so yes. we didn't do it. What was the other one? It was vertical drilling. As opposed to? Horizontal drilling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. gallons of water and we're only putting approximately 400,000 gallons of water since we're recycling 70% of the flow back that comes out of the well. And then after it's done, the equipment's taken out and the land is vegetated to fit back in with the surrounding land. They had to produce written proposals to their clients um, that were even more in-depth than the current one. Um, yeah, so I
they've recently been taken off like the endangered species list. And after they established the population, like we would allow the hunting of otters. Any other questions? 